Yeah. And uh, over to you, Trev. Introduction to EME. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks for uh, everyone. Uh, everyone that's that's turned up, and uh, hopefully, what I've got to say will be uh, perhaps of uh, of some interest. Okay. Next one. All right. Why get involved? Why go to uh, Why go to all this trouble? Uh, many years ago, when I was talking to my neighbour, I was in the process of putting up a big antenna system, and I was explaining a bit about it. And he told me, he says, wouldn't it be much easier to use the internet rather than <laughs> yeah. trying to do what you're doing? Well, it's still, um, EME is still regarded as the last frontier in, uh, in amateur radio. And achievement in doing, in doing something difficult well, apart from anything else, it's something different to do. But it's uh, it's a good learning term, or a, a good learning um, experience, uh, because everything's got to be pretty right in, in, in order to do it. So that's hence the achievement in doing uh, in doing something difficult. Just a brief history of uh, of EME. The first amateur first contact was made in 1960, uh, the year that I was licensed. Uh, I'm not in the picture. Um, it was done on 23 centimeters from Southern California to a station in Hawaii. They had they had quite good equipment. Uh, other than the preamp, it was a very difficult. It took them three months to do this, and a lot of the uh, correspondence was made by just by simply posting letters. Uh, the team there is from the IMAC uh, Corporation. They were on the Southern California end. Uh, I think the dish is twelve. Was a twelve foot dish. Going by the height of those people, it looks like about a twelve foot dish. Um, they had plenty of power. I think it was about 600 watts. But the big problem, the problem uh, was CW. Uh, the big problem was the noise figure of the preamps of the day. The equipment that they used would work just as well today with a uh, with a modern preamp. I don't know what the noise figure would be. It might have been, but it might have been probably four or five dB. Perhaps I don't know. Um, now, prior to 1960, the, uh, the possibility of reflecting a signal off the moon was first discovered uh, actually during World War II, I think Germany, and uh, at the end of World War II, uh, British radar uh, confirmed the course by the length of time it took for the return echo. So uh, the radar echoes were in fact, uh, accidental. And <clears throat> about 15 years later, uh, it, uh, it morphed into, uh, into amateur uh, circles. Okay. All right, requirements to get started. <clears throat> There's a few things to consider about how you want to go about it. Now, some people just want to do it, say, once, just to get the piece of paper on the wall, or some people want to sort of do a more serious effort, uh, which was the case with myself. Uh, but either way, uh, yagis and dishes, um, you can get secondhand dishes. Depends on the uh, band that you're using, but which I'll cover that in the next uh, slide. Uh, a dish feed, uh, I'll be mainly talking about, um, or mainly assuming that dishes are going to be used, uh, uh, certainly from 1296 uh, upwards. An amplifier, you'll need some power. LNA, a very critical part of the, uh, of the equipment. Uh, not so much at, uh, say, two metres, where you're competing with uh, a very high noise, a sky noise temperature. Uh, azimuth and elevation control a means of turning the dish in, uh, in those two uh, axes. All right. All right, choice of bands. 
Now, a bit of a mistake is that people starting out, or people wanting to get into EMA, EME, their choice of band tends to be uh, based on what equipment they've already got. They say, well, I don't have anything for 1296, but I do have a bit of power on 432, or I've got a plenty of power on two meters, so we'll go, we'll go that band. Uh, but um, from my, I've never operated two meters. I've never, uh, I've operated 432, um, 2302, 1296, and, uh, and nine, nine centimeters. So there's lots of choices. The higher in frequency you go, the, the easier it is. Uh, as an example, the, uh, the transition from 432 to 1296 is, uh, was quite amazing in terms of the, signal, of the signal strength. So the higher the band, uh, you've got the extra dB of the antenna, of course, but also you've got that advantage on receive uh, as well. Mode considerations. These days, it's probably a 50-50 mix of analog, which is primarily CW, uh, and, uh, and JT. There would be more. I think about uh, um, a statistic that I read a couple of years ago was that 60% of all amateur radio contacts made in the world are made with digital, uh, by digital means. So... If you're a CW guy, uh, myself, I'm not that good in conversational CW, but the exchanging, the, the minimum requirements to call it a completed QSO uh, are, not, uh, are not, all that, not all that difficult. The two most popular bands currently are probably um, 1296 and in the last year or two, 10 gigs has really, has really taken off. And there's a few reasons for that. Uh, both of those bands, unlike, say, uh, 13 centimetres and 9 centimetres, both, both 1296 and uh, 23 and 10 gigs uh, have international allocations. And neither, well, a bit of a question mark on 23 centimetres, uh, but at this stage, neither are under threat um, for, uh, by being eliminated. Having said that, there's a very important conference taking place next month in November, which is called RAC 23, and that may well decide, <coughs> excuse me, decide the future of 23 centimetres in terms of running a bit of power. Uh, it all that uh, that problem was initiated by really only two two instances of of interference to navigation uh, equipment. Galileo satellite, I think, was one of them, and uh, and something else. So the the amateur community at this conference. Uh, IREU is uh, is fairly well represented by a couple of prominent uh, prominent uh, prominent amateurs. So the outcome of that is going to determine uh, the future of 23 centimeter EME. Now it probably won't change in this country, but of course if uh, if um, Europe and the North America can't, uh, can't operate it, well then we would have nobody to uh, uh, communicate with. With MSL. Sorry? We'd have other VKs. We could yeah, have. other VKs, yes. Um, mode considerations, uh, I've already mentioned. Uh, JT, of course, is an obvious choice in terms of its uh, big advantage. 20 dB, perhaps, advantage uh, over, uh, over CW. And uh, digital is certainly revolutionised not just EME, but any uh, any weak signal uh, situation. All right, well, this is an interesting uh, an interesting uh, subject. How good a reflector is uh, is the moon? Now, despite its shape, it's the wrong, absolutely the wrong shape. 
I don't know if the other side of the moon is the right shape. I don't think it is. Uh, it's also a rough, dry surface. But nevertheless, uh, even taking those uh, factors into consideration, uh, it's still only 11.6 dB off being a perfect reflector. A perfect meaning a reflector, a normal reflector, which is say uh, 50 um, with 50 percent efficiency. And the gain of the moon at uh, 1296 is 142 dB, working on a 50% efficiency. Would anyone like to hazard a guess how big a dish you would need on 1296 for have 146 dB gain? Probably a bit difficult. Uh, Wayne already move. Wayne confirmed the following figure. Okay, you would need a dish 1,200 kilometers in diameter. <laughs> is is the answer when I first. When I first read that, I thought mm, sounded a bit much for me, but I have had it confirmed uh, by um, resident mathematician uh, Wayne for WS, and it is indeed a equivalent to a 1,200 kilometre diameter dish. <clears throat> Distance from Earth, Moon follows a 28-day cycle, and it varies between about 355,000 k to 405,000 k over that 28-day cycle. Uh, that represents between minimum and maximum distance about 2 dB. So it's reasonably, uh, reasonably significant. The path loss at uh, path loss at 1296. I'll just refer to my notes here to uh, to get that uh, right. Is 271 dB uh, and the same amount back minus the gain of the moon itself. So it's still definite, very definitely. A, it's a weak signal, uh, obviously a weak signal situation. And that's one of the just going just referring back to the why do it is uh, uh, the whole object of the exercise. Well, the only difficulty, or you can say the only difficulty of the exercise is that you have to overcome path loss. Unlike say six meter DX, where you where there's seasonal variations, eleven year cycles, diurnal variations, uh, the moon will work all the time. Uh, on bands up to and including 10 gigs without any problems. 24 gig EME and upwards, uh, a different story. There's a reasonable amount of activity on 24 gigs. Um, the only station that I know of in Australia uh, capable of that is Rex uh, 7 mo The highest band that a two-way contact has been made is 47 gigs a fair while ago in 2013 so it's 10 years of technology back uh, and there is a Russian <coughs> excuse me a Russian station uh, a very technically and intellectual guy uh, he has received echoes on 77 gigs but no two-way uh, no two ways is, uh, has ever been achieved. Uh, okay, next one. Right, these are the challenges. Well, path loss. We'll just run through these. Um, I'll just go down uh, a little bit. Doppler shift, everyone is familiar with uh, what causes the apparent change in frequency. With the moon, with the moon, the highest Doppler, the, uh, because Doppler is the relative movement between two objects, so therefore Doppler will be highest on a rising or setting moon, and for and briefly will be zero when it's overhead. In other words, when there's no relative motion between the trans transmitting and uh, and receiving. To put that into perspective, the maximum Doppler at 10 gigs is about 35 kilohertz. 
and you can get that information from tracking programs, which I'll mention a little bit uh, uh, later. Okay, overcoming the path loss, as I've already mentioned, uh, is uh, is what is the is the requirement, and losses before preamp. Well, I've got some. This is a, a 3.4 gig uh, feed, uh, left-hand polarity, polarization is used for uh, the downlink, the receive, and right-hand uh, right upwards. The idea, this preamp here, the idea is that we don't have any loss between the probe and the preamp. In, the, in my case, I've had to use a 90 degree connector adapter uh, and the loss of this transco relay itself. So it's fairly uh, about the minimum that I could get. But just to highlight the importance of it, this bit of this is quarter inch superflex. It's a six foot length of superflex. Uh, with a connector on each end. If we had the preamp, if we had this onto the probe and the preamp, it's, this is pretty innocent looking, but if we had the preamp on this end, the attenuation of this at 3.4 gigs is a bit over a dB. But it doesn't add a dB to the noise figure. What we can do is to work out the losses in what I've got and what we've got here add this and then we've got a ratio of this to the total and it's roughly about three times as much. So putting this in here would degrade the noise figure by 3 dB, which in a weak signal uh, application uh, and particularly this weak signal application would kill most of, would kill most of the contacts. So the exercise is in keeping these um, losses before the preamp. What happens afterwards doesn't really make too much difference. This particular preamp, which is from W5AGO, uh, it's a two-stage preamp, has about 26 dB of gain. So subsequent losses from here uh, are reasonably irrelevant. In fact, you could run a long length of RG213 the losses of which, the attenuation of which would be easily overcome by that. Losses beyond the preamp, between the preamp and the receiver, do contribute to the overall noise figure, but only fractionally. If after this preamp we had, say, 3 or 4 dB loss, the contribution of that to the overall noise figure would be approximately 0.1 of a dB. In, in other words, um, pretty, pretty much uh, nothing. Now, losses due to dish surface inaccuracy, which is uh, a bit of a scary, uh, uh, a bit of a scary uh, figure. And if we had 1 20th of a wavelength error, which at uh, 23 centimetres is, uh, what is that? Um, 23 centimetres, a tenth would be, is that about 12, 12 mils, I think? Anyway, a 1 20th of a wavelength error in the dish surface accuracy, which is not much, would degrade the gain of it by 1.7 dB. Probably, most cases, not too much to worry about. If we had a 10% error, which is still probably not too much, we've now got 6.9 dB of loss, which, you know, is, is a lot. If we had an eighth of a wavelength error, it's up to nearly 11 dB, which, which would sort of render the, the dish pretty useless. And the dB loss equals the uh, square of the RMS uh, error. Uh, radio amateurs like using cheap dishes. Sorry? Radio amateurs like using cheap dishes of unknown origin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Right, next challenge is polarity mismatch. Now, in the case of, okay, say um, 2 metres, 6 metres, and 432, the standard is linear polarisation. Uh, incidentally, there have been the lowest band that I've heard of where uh, an EME contact has been made is 10 metres. And someone has done echo testing at 15 metres. A lot of noise to, uh, to worry about. Uh, this, this is a dual, because of the frequency, this is um, circular polarisation. The signals fed into it. There's a set. There's a polarizer in there, which acts as a uh, as a delay line, and then the two signals are mixed at the front to give circular polarization. So, in terms of polarity mismatch, of course, uh, it's it's irrelevant. But let's talk about two meters and 432 megs. Two meters and 70 centimeters. There's two ways that you can get a polarity mismatch. Well, first off, if you've got a polarity mismatch of, say, 45 degrees, that equates to a 6 dB disadvantage. So the two, the two reasons for having a polarity mismatch are spatial and Faraday. Spatial is... If you've got two stations somewhere on the Earth, with a both looking at the Moon, depending on their relationship where they are on the globe, some some will see the they won't all see the Moon at the same polarity. Some will see it maybe 90, 90 degrees off. Uh, spatial because it's uh, because it's based on geometry, uh, spatial mismatch. Uh, of course, can be uh, can be calculated. So that's one that's one problem, and that's a disadvantage of setting up a station uh, where the uh, polarity is a linear linear polarity. The next reason for a polarity mismatch between receive and transmit is Faraday rotation. Probably most of you know what Faraday rotation is, as the signal goes through the uh, atmosphere, it will shift in polarity, both there and coming back. Now, of course, you can, you can fluke it. You might, you might come on, or you might, uh, whether it be spatial or Faraday rotation causing the polarity mismatch, you can fluke it where everything, everything lines up. The only way round in a linear station, the only way round polarity mismatch is to rotate the array about its bore axis. And Alan Downey, who I think most of you know, has got a Yagi system which does just that. It rotates as well as azimuth and elevation, uh, it will rotate about its bore axis. Wonder who made it? Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, wonder who made it. Yeah, I did make it. Yeah, I'm guilty. Yeah, um, I built that in uh, uh, 1990, 1999. It doesn't work good because Alan worked me. Sorry, 70, I've worked Alan on 70 EMA. Oh right, you have with, done. With, yeah, 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 with I a think. single 21 element and 70 watts. Boy, that's yeah. That means it's still working. Mm. Yeah. The big array that is. They even sent me a QSL card too. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fair. Uh, okay. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. wasn't aware of that. I know he's made a lot of contacts yeah. with um, with small stations. No, it's, e it's easy to do. I, I didn't even have it on a rotator. I just said I'm going to try and put the backyard point in. Right. But he, he was able to do the work. Yeah. With, with two linear polarized stations, of course, only one needs to compensate for polarity mismatch. Um, the problem when both stations uh, have that ability is that they will tend to chase each other. You don't really know, is he 
Oh, in your case, it's simple. You were fixed. He just he yeah, picked, Alan, Alan writes on it. Yeah, he picked. He peaked on your receive signal. Mm -hmm. When he went to transmit, he would have had to rotate the array um, ninety degrees, so that you can hear his transmitted yeah. uh, signal. And I think not long before that, Kevin, we all worked. Is that big German yeah. station? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On 70. Mm, on 70, you, you didn't have elevation or anything. No. Yeah. In terms, in terms of choice of, of a band, circular polarization, having operated both, I would now, if I were, for anyone setting up a serious effort, I wouldn't bother with anything linear. And that's probably the best band to do it on is 1296. Where none of this, there's no uh, polarity lockout. Uh, it just makes it all uh, a lot simpler. Okay, we've talked about Doppler shift uh, tracking, obviously uh, tracking programs. Naturally, the moon has to be. Um, you have to be looking uh, at the moon. You can do it. I know Wayne has made a lot of two meter contacts with a. Uh, a fixed elevation on uh, JT. And the other thing, the other challenge, of course, is maintaining co visibility. You've got to be able to, both stations have got to be able to see the moon. Now, at any, at any one point, at any given time of the day, uh, about 50% of the world is able to see the moon at, at once. Wherever, whoever can see the moon as we can at the moment, it's roughly overhead. Um, so we are part of the 50% of the globe that can see it, but not all of that 50% have got amateurs. So co-visibility. Now, being at the latitude that VK is, even this latitude that we're at, one of the difficulties which comes under a challenge is that most, nearly all contacts that we're going to make will either be on a rising moon, which will favour North America, they are on a setting moon, and as far as Europe is concerned, which is where most of the world's um, EME population resides, we do it on our setting moon. Now, Europe and North America, of course, they've got, they can do it for a much bigger percentage of the time. So here, um, just say thinking in terms of looking at Europe, you really have to have a pretty good horizon uh, towards the northwest, around about 300, 320 degrees. And not everyone can do that. Trees, of course, are good attenuators. Uh, any foliage, it soaks up RF like blotting paper. So you really need a, a clear shot. And this is why uh, it's not appreciated in North America. Most of the world's activity takes place from Europe. There's, surprisingly, there's, there's relatively little from uh, North America. And there's not much from Japan either. We're okay with Japan. We don't. We can. Their moon and our moon are a little bit similar. So, um, okay. All right. Measurements. Nature provides a means, an extremely good means, of testing your equipment out. And there's two tests you can do. Okay, the preamp that you've got, of course, can be and, and most likely would have been checked. The noise figure and gain would have been checked before you got it. But comparing the sun noise to cold sky will tell you the gain of your system. But comparing a cold sky to ground or a 50 ohm load will, will tell you the noise temperature of your system. Now, as everyone knows, say a strength 5 signal 
which is a pretty strong signal. I'm talking about terrestrial, but if you've got an S7 or S8 noise level, uh, suddenly the signal to noise ratio is, is not good. <coughs> so typically uh, with this setup here on my dish, between cold sky to ground, I get about 7 dB of, of comparison. So you can play with preamp, so you can play with um, connectors and that to try and, uh, and reduce that. Sometimes uh, uh, measuring the preamp in a laboratory environment is not the same as the real thing. Now the sun noise will, is determined uh, primarily by the solar flux index. At the moment, solar flux index is around 150 to, uh, to 160. The high for this cycle so far took place about six months ago. I think it went, I think it went as high as 300. Uh, but typically, again on this feed with the current solar flux index, I'm seeing about 16 dB between looking at the sun and looking at a cold sky. Now, cold definition of a cold sky. There are lots of sun, lots of uh, noise sources, and as most people would realise, uh, galactic uh, noise. A tracking program, which I'll come to a little bit later, such as three UMs, that has that will tell you, that will show you where you are and where to point for a cold to the cold sky at, at any uh, particular given time. So sun noise will tell you the gain of the system, but it's much more important to know the noise figure of your system, or the, should I say the noise temperature. It doesn't matter if the signal's weak, so long as it's stronger than the background noise. And if it is, you'll be able to, uh, to copy it. Noise temperature is... Um, uh, in term, it is normally, it can either be expressed in dB or in degrees Kelvin. And 1 dB is about 70 degrees Kelvin. So sometimes cold sky, a cold sky at above about 400 megs, above about 70 centimetres, is only about 4 or 5 degrees Kelvin, which in the relative sense is very quiet. Whereas two meters or six meters uh, can be a few thousand degrees Kelvin. Uh, those, those bands are very noisy. Consequently, the higher up in frequency you go, particularly above 432, the easier, the easier your task uh, will be. So sun noise, cold sky, both available, uh, free, and you can... Um, <coughs> Okay, VK3UM's EME calculator, you can put all the parameters of your station into that, and he will tell you you should be getting a certain amount of sun noise, and you should be getting a certain amount of cold sky to ground comparison. And these are called Y factors. So going by, going by that, you can say, right, I'm measuring this, I do it with a step attenuator. You can say, well, he says I should be getting 6 dB and I'm only getting 4 dB. So what, what, is, the, uh, what is the problem? So it's fairly easy to optimise a station um, by these means. Next one. Yep. There are various forums. Uh, not various forums, there's one or two forums, but HB9Q, a Swiss station, is, um, is a very popular forum. It's a meeting place, of course. It's a bit like VK Spotter, it's really the same as VK Spotter, but a global version of it. And it's separated into various bands, so you can go 432, see who's on, any comments. You can see who has been on in the last uh, hour. 
but that's uh, that's fairly important. And as I said, it's like VK, uh, it's, it's the EME equivalent of um, the VK spotter. All right. All right, well, I've already actually covered this uh, a bit out of sequence. How quiet is the sky at various frequencies? Well, the higher the higher the frequency, the quieter the, the sky. And that's what you're, that of course is what, uh, what, what you're competing with. There are various uh, few contests. Uh, Dubis, probably a lot of people subscribe to Dubis, get the magazine. Uh, Dubis and ARRL contest, there's probably, um, there's probably about, between them, about half a dozen uh, a year. And that's when you're going to find the most, most activity. There tends to be not so much activity uh, in between. And as I said before, there's, there's certainly been a migration to, um, uh, to 10 gigs. Is Having there a contest on this weekend, sorry? Sorry? Is there a, when's the next contest? A what? The next contest, when is that? Uh, the next contest yeah. is this coming weekend. It is this weekend. Yeah, this yeah. Weekend. Uh, it is this weekend, and there's one also uh, a month from now. Uh, and it's an ARRL yeah, I think it's an ARRL contest. Uh, there's also two other contests that I haven't got here. One is an Italian EME contest, and one another one is a Russian EME contest. Now, a rather unfortunate thing has happened to the Russian EME contest. The amateur radio fraternity has taken it upon themselves to mostly or mostly convince everyone to boycott the contest mm -hmm. because of the Ukraine situation. Um, I suppose you can look at it, uh, I know this is a little bit off topic, but uh, it's, it's relevant nevertheless. Um, it's not one that I particularly agree with, but um, and there's been a few messages on MoonNet, and uh, there's been a few explanations from prominent Russian amateurs, who of course are very embarrassed by all this. But I think in the main, they are still getting contacts. But nevertheless, there was uh, on uh, public forums uh, more than just suggestions about why the rest of the world's amateurs shouldn't have anything to do with Russian amateurs. So I guess it's a personal thing. It's uh, uh, Some people would think quite strongly towards it. Um, I don't think it's the uh, fault of, well, it's not the fault of Russian amateurs. And moreover, there's nothing they can do about it. Anyway, that's, a, that's another uh, topic. I think, is there any, any more? Oh yeah, tracking programs. There are quite a few, quite a few tracking programs, uh, all um, downloadable, uh, all free. I think VK, in my opinion, uh, I've tried one or two. I think VK3UM is generally globally recognised uh, as uh, as being the gold standard. Uh, as you know, he passed away several years ago, but he put a lot of effort into this. And the tracking program uh, has a lot of features. Anyone, I would suggest that anyone even remotely interested in getting started on EME, uh, before they did anything else, I would suggest that they download this program. Does anyone here have this program? Yeah. Okay, there's a few. Okay, yeah. Uh, it will tell you uh, a lot. It will give you um, co-visibility. It will give you Doppler, of course, correction required for the co from your point of view. Also, the Doppler correction at the other end. And it's in two, two parts. Uh, that's uh, EME um, tracking and the EME calculator. 
you can, as I mentioned before, you can determine how good your station is or how good it isn't. You can, it will tell you the gain of a particular dish at a particular frequency with a particular uh, FD ratio. Uh, very, very good, very uh, useful, um, uh, useful software. As far as uh, I'll just, uh, we'll just leave this one here at the moment. Um, I mentioned earlier about yagis and dishes. Uh, dishes used to be fairly cheaply available from um, uh, from satellite uh, suppliers, but these days, <clears throat> if you are looking for a dish, say in the 2.3 meter range, obviously it will depend on the band. But a good source around the Sunnybank and Sunnybank Hills areas, which has a high Asian population, there are, would be hundreds of dishes that are no longer used. But the Asians started off with satellite TV, which required at least a 2.3 metre. Sometimes you'll strike a 3 metre uh, a dish. That's all been replaced by, um, by Optus, by the... Uh, satellite, uh, universal satellite reception from geosynchronous uh, satellite with 600 mil dishes and everyone's, everyone has uh, seen them. I think they, um, I know the, uh, we have one, uh, the, the LO is 10, 10 gigs, uh, sorry, yeah, 10 gigs something, uh, and I think the IF is about 2 gigs. But in any event, that has replaced backyard, uh, relatively complex satellite systems. And I, I've scored a few dishes just in the course of my work, or um, mostly if you go and knock on the door, when you see a dish that's obviously, you say, well, look, I'll, I'm happy to take it down for you uh, at, at no charge. And of course, you end up with a, uh, a, a free dish. Uh, is that it? Uh, okay. I'll just um, I'll just mention something else, which is uh, which may be of interest. It's um, allied to EME, and that is reception deep space network is the name of it, and that is reception of spacecraft, NASA spacecraft. Well, there's lots of them now. Even India has got them. Um, but there is a, there is a dedicated uh, forum uh, to it. And it's quite remarkable at what amateur systems are, are able to, to receive. Now, the two common ones are Mars, orbit, Mars and Jupiter orbiters. Jupiter currently is at about 650 million K, uh, so it's pretty good DX. And Mars is currently about half that. And Gary, 4GU, received a, a very good reception. This was about two years ago. Uh, it was the um, a Mars uh, orbiter, a Mars reconnaissance orbiter, wasn't it? That you received MRO. The, no, it wasn't MRO. It was the. Um, was it another one? Yeah. Yeah, there are quite a few Mars. Yeah. Quite a few the, orbiters. The one that was going into orbit around Mars, but they, they must have had the carrier on. Right. Uh, it was um, getting into the right orbit around Mars. Yeah. I think they had the carrier. Running. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was Emirates. I think it was. Yeah. Well, Gary sent me a screenshot of that uh, event, and it was quite spectacular. I do remember the distance. It was 256 million k when you when you received that uh, on a three metre dish. I think it was linear polarisation, wasn't it? No, no, I built. Um, I built oh, okay, it was circular. circular polarization. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, the hit that you take um, receiving a left hand or right hand circular polarisation with linear polarisation is three dB. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's half power. But there's quite a, it, 
I'm, I'm quite interested in it. I, I have, I am set up for it, but I've only received one, uh, which by DX standards, one spacecraft called Stereo A, at a distance of 18 million k. Now that distance, in terms of deep space network and deep space reception, is like uh, listening to the Brisbane Beacon. Uh, this particular, the time that I got it was 28 dB above the noise, so it's pretty. Very strong signal and, and no problems. But there are stations that have received, or detected that is, uh, from Jupiter spacecraft using as little as a 1.8 metre dish. Now, when you consider that the three main tracking stations around the world, which are Madrid, Goldstone and our one here in Canberra, all have 70 meter dishes. Uh, I, th I think it's quite it's, it's a real a real technical challenge to you know to receive something it's which on, Gary has already achieved. Is that on 8 gig? Yes. yes. There are three three bands. Uh, the main the main bands of interest are around about um, uh, 8.4 gigs. There are a number of spacecraft, mainly moon orbiting spacecraft, which are on just below the 13 centimetre band, around about 2.2 gigs. 2.2 gigs was the frequency, or close to it, used by the uh, uh, man on the moon in 1969, of course, which Canberra played a big part in, um, in uh, receiving it. And so two, two, 2 gigs, 8 gigs, and more recently 32 gigs, a KU band. 32 gigs uh, was treated by NASA as an experiment because it was, it was unknown whether 30, how well 32 gigs would work. And as it turns out, uh, the reason for the doubt was the absorption through the, at that frequency uh, coming back to Earth, but they have come to the conclusion that it's a very viable, a very viable frequency, uh, and that's where the future, well, the future of everything really, in terms of communication, is going higher, uh, higher in frequency. So with all the numbers and all the maths and everything, it said it shouldn't. So with all the maths and the numbers and everything, yeah, it said it shouldn't have worked. Yeah, that's right. But it did work, and it did work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's dead right, Cole. Yeah. Uh, now, there's one amateur, um, a G station, an English station, that not only, not only was able to receive a spacecraft from many millions of K out on 32 gigs, but he did it with all with homebrew equipment, and and I think to, I think that was a remarkable uh, a remarkable achievement. But he didn't go to J Carp or Lesby. No, that's right. <laughs> um, certainly, 32 gigs would be well beyond my technical mm. and intellectual uh, ability. Uh, that's uh, real, real uh, cutting edge, uh, cutting edge stuff. So, a lot of people here would have actually have. In fact, I'd say the majority of people here would already have uh, a terrestrial station. Uh, as Wayne has demonstrated, that would be capable of two two meter uh, EME contacts, just as what you've got, and relying, of course, on someone at the other end having, you know, a lot of power and uh, and uh, big big an big antenna systems. Is there anything that I haven't covered that someone would any any questions really, or is there anything that I People might wonder so that, that I have... VK3UM software is very clunky and difficult to use first up. So VK3UM is difficult? Yeah, it, it requires a lot of information and it can be a little bit daunting when you look at it. Uh, I think this is in determining station performance you're talking oh, about. Yeah, that. Yeah. But have you, you would have used uh, Moonscape? No, I haven't. I've heard of it. Yeah. I find that for tracking. Much is that much simpler? Yeah, 10 times have you used it, Mike? 
Oh, yeah, that's what I normally that's use. There. That's what I use also. Okay. And it gives you the K visibility, everything, and it's just right. instantaneous, and it's you don't have to be a genius to yeah, run okay. find that yeah. you in, which is very good, no, no doubt. But it's, if there's so many parameters you have to put in. Yeah, okay. Yeah. This is, yeah, are you talking about station info or, or getting... Anything. You, anything. you open that, that VK3UN program, yeah. And you look, you go, oh shit, and you just close it. Right, okay. I like that. <laughs> well, I, did, I just went, ah, oh, that's too much. You have, to have all, you have to have all your numbers ready. You do. Like that that program. Program. It yeah. looks like it's really clever, but you need all your numbers available. Exactly. And that's, I found, I found it really daunting. Whereas Moonscape, it just asks you for some basic information which yeah. you'll have oh, right there. Yeah. And then go visit. And that's how you find out when the uh, German Tendig beacons are. Yeah. I, I was, yes. uh, originally I started out just trying to, to go to like the mm. time of day website wh and, where they memorize or whatever, and then Moonscape just wham. We just go poof. This, this is right the window, and then you can tell it give me a week's worth, and then it'll just, this is what time I'm going to be looking at. Yeah. But no, it, fair enough. But it, it's a really good program. But three but UM is, is the gold standard. Yeah. This this will tell you if you have your numbers ready. This will give you all the oh. uh, the measurements for your station mm. and where you stand or, or don't stand. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody out thinking, there in Teams World got any questions at all? We can hear you. If you just uh, fire anything in, we'll be able to hear you. Actually, the Yanks are going to 902 megahertz. I've got a question. Yep. So what I can do, I'll, um, I'll be keeping this uh, um, PowerPoint, of course, and I'll add Moonscape. I had heard of Moonscape, but um, mm. uh, it, I certainly didn't know any, anything about it. It's, uh, it's pretty right. Doug, Doug's got a question. Yeah, Doug. Doug, uh, I'm speaking hopefully that Michael picked me up too. Um, the concept of uh, the gain of the moon being such a high number of TV totally eluded me. I've never, never heard of that before. <coughs> what, what Sorry, what happened you heard before? The gain of the moon. The gain of the moon early on. Yeah. What what's it actually gain over what? You know, how, how does the geometry of the situation around TV? Right, well, the gain of the moon is determined by, they know that it's, okay, well, we know the diameter of the moon, for one thing. I th is it about 4,000 K? I've just forgotten, no, less than that. Is it about 4,000 K? I don't know. Okay, now, the, the gain of the moon is determined, or should I say the efficiency of the moon as a reflector, is determined by the amount of sunlight that is reflected off the moon. And that figure is about 7%. So in other words, from a perfect reflector, if it were a perfect reflector, it would be 100%, but 7% equates to about 12 dB. So that's, that's where the 12 dB comes from. The path, the, the path loss at various frequencies, uh, of course, can be determined by, fr there's the formula for it, I don't have it in my head, uh, but the, the free space <coughs> loss. So we've got a signal going to the moon, we know that attenuation, the signal coming back is the same, so add those two together, minus the gain of the moon as a reflector, which will give you the actual path loss, which is, in the case of 23 centimetres, about 270, 271 dB. So that's how they've determined that. I think I'm, I think I'm following you there, but what, what gives the moon, as I determined, it's not lost, is it? It's, Sorry, what gives the... Is it 100 and whatever so dB um, a stronger signal than another situation or is it comparing something totally round to something totally reflection? I'm not... um, no, it's what just, uh, okay, it's assuming the first assumption is how, what gain would the moon have if it were a perfect reflector? Mm -hmm. Now that can be easily determined by its diameter. The next one is how efficient it is, we know that. Um, it's about 12 dB, dB away from that, or, or off that perfect reflector. So knowing the, reflect, the reflected sunlight versus the diameter of the moon, you can tell, then work out the actual gain of it. 
That's that's how those figures. That's, that's, that's the gain that, that, that that's, that's the moon is is acting upon the sunlight. Yes. From the sun. Yes. Or the heat. Or the, yes. Or the fact that it's a steel object. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. Because it's not like a steel ball that all the light's coming here and it's being scattered like that. It's being scattered similarly from all over the visible front part. Yeah. Of well, presumably radio signals are scattered the same. But that's why it has that vibration. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, other uh, other amateur radio uh, related to weak signal work, um, amateur radio milestones, which certainly have impressed me. Um, 2006 CT1 uh, Lewis Cupido, I've just forgotten his. CT1 DMK. Yeah, yeah, yes, DMK. Yeah, he received with a five meter dish in his garden, surrounded by potatoes and tomato plants. Uh, he was able to receive Voyager 1 in 2006. And with a lot of interrogation, um, the distance, oh, first of all, the setup on Voyager 1 is a 12 foot dish, the one in my one in the picture. Uh, and the power at that time was about 8 watts. Distance was 13 billion K which is quite a few hours and of course one well quite a, quite apart from the obvious problems is the problems of tracking and of course um, Voyager 1 and 2 are around 8.4 gigs uh, was calculating Doppler it's, to me it's just an incredible intellectual exercise as far as well as a technical exercise so that's one milestone. Oh, and he did it with linear polarization too, uh, whereas the spacecraft generate left-hand uh, circular polarity. <clears throat> Trevor, did you ever find that audio file of your nine centimeter CW? Content? Yeah, I did. Yes. You did find yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah that, was, that, was, that was good. Yeah, there's an audio of Trevor's CW contact on one of the web pages. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, no, that was up yeah, that was that was quite good. It's stock and signal from you. Yeah, yeah, it was a good signal. It was done with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, just getting back to uh, Voyager One reception by amateurs, it's been done a, a few times since. There was a very big effort about two years ago by a group of German uh, amateurs that seemingly had a lot of problems doing it, but they, they achieved it with a, 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 with a bigger dish. The other, um, more related to EME, was in 2016, a group of German operate, uh, amateurs with a borrowed 60-foot dish and a home-brewed 7KW PA uh, received their echoes off Venus, which is, to my way of thinking, uh, pretty pretty amazing. Not the EME, it's EVE. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Not the EME, but EVE. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, EVE. That's 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 correct. Um, I was actually going to look up the distance to Venus before I. Anyway, the distance it would have wouldn't be the same. Uh, the signal, I think. The return signal was about 15 minutes. Uh, there and back to the moon is two seconds. Two so we can work out. I think it was a 15 minute return trip from Venus. So um, how many two seconds are there in 15 minutes is quite a few. It's quite a bit of atmospheric absorption on Venus. What's that? <laughs> the, the, the atmosphere on Venus is pretty horrible. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so that was, uh, yeah. Of course, records are, are always being uh, are always being broken. I can't think of anything else of mutual interest, uh, weak signal, but uh, work. Uh, but anyway, that is uh, a few basics of EME. Uh, probably a lot of people here might have already known some of it. But it's certainly, if you're looking for something to do. Uh, 
as I mentioned at the beginning, is still the last frontier. Definitely worthwhile. Everybody here would have 70 centimetres and a small yeah. yard of some description. Like, and you just keep an eye on that um, HP9Q. Yeah, that will tell you who's on, yep. What's his name? Jerk? No. There's Jerk also. He's yeah, the yeah. Station. Actually, what is his name? I've just forgotten. Yeah. I should know it. And because he uses that for looking at some astro stuff or something, but he just That's right. to fire it up. What is it, 127 Yagis at 15 elements? Yeah, yeah, elements. there was that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you can actually hear him in the speaker, he's that loud with yeah. the Yagis. So it's, no, it's easy to do. Trevor, I've got a question. Could I ask a question, guys? It's uh, Phil, um, VK4IIO, Hi, in Phil. the Wit Sundays. Yes, good evening. Well, first of all, thank you for an excellent. Uh, yes, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation, Trevor. Very, very informative. I was just interested to know how many uh, of you within the group are active on 23. I'm very close, as Kevin will know, to uh, getting a portable station running. Um, is there anybody locally that uh, would be available for tests at some time in the future? I live in a radio desert up here. There's there's no amateurs at anywhere to be seen. So uh, having somebody I could uh, call upon to assist with a test would be, would be yeah. great. Sorry, whereabouts do you live again? Whit Sundays. Oh, Whit Sundays. Okay. The yeah. only um, the only other VK4 station that I'm aware of that is operating on 23 centimeter EMA is Phil 4 CDI. In fact, I worked yeah. him, he and I, well, he and I have had a lot of contacts. We had one uh, a few days ago. Of course, it doesn't have is to be in Queensland. Um, anywhere. Is, he, is he still in, uh, he was in uh, Toowoomba, wasn't he, at some point? Is that right? Uh, he used to be in Toowoomba. He's now on the Sunshine Coast. Oh, okay, right. Uh, uh, he's got a 12-foot dish, uh, also a high-power permit, which is uh, sort of keeps it tidy. Uh, he's mainly um, mainly a JT operator, mainly digital operator, uh, but uh, coerced he will do a, a CW contact. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. How, how close are you to uh, being operational? Uh, I've got the dish, the feed, the amplifier. I've just got to install the uh, Leo Bodner um, gear into the 90. 700 so that yes. i get the stability so i i think within a month i should be in a position to start uh, testing yeah okay well that that's good it sounds like you will be um uh, with the leo bodner uh modification to your radio you you're more oriented perhaps towards digital uh i could do a bit of cw if, if push but certainly uh jt was the way i intended to go kevin and i when i lived in brisbane received signals from the moon but i've never actually transmitted uh, and, and heard any contact or had a contact as yet right okay well, on 23. okay well, let's go well keep in touch with me and certainly we can do some uh, tests well you can do some tests obviously with anyone but um uh, being local uh, in the global sense, uh, keep in contact and I'd be interested in your progress. I will do, thank you. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll unmute, thank you. Yeah, yeah, good to hear from you. Um, yeah. Gary's got a question too, Trevor. Trevor. Sorry, Gary. You were saying before, I think, that um, that you get 7 dB um, out of that, that feed horn, 7 dB... Uh, cold sky to ground. Cold sky to ground. Yes. That's with the dish. Yeah. Yeah. What about just just the feed horn facing the ground and then back to the sky? You see anything? Um, okay. Uh, uh, coal sky to ground, I have found that it's the same as looking into a 50 ohm load. Okay. The same. <clears throat> this setup here, this single pole double throw uh, relay, will switch. <clears throat> Okay, the isolation between the two, the receive and transmit ports uh, on this particular feed is about 22 dB. But you need more than that so that on transmit, the preamp, which can handle about a milliwatt, naught dBm, the preamp is further isolated from the transmit by this relay here. So on transmit, the preamp 
the preamp is switched to this 50 ohm load. And the isolation of this relay at 3.4 gigs, I think Wayne measured it for me, was 38 dB. So 38 plus 22 is 60 dB of isolation, which means to protect a preamp, you could run a kilowatt in here and for one milliwatt uh, there. But as far as a uh, cold sky to ground, um, the advantage of what you can do is that on receive, you can activate this relay when you're looking at a cold sky so that the relay is now look, has now seen a 50 ohm load. The advantage of that is that you don't have to lower the, ant the dish down to the ground, going up and down, up and down. So just with a switch. Normally, of course, this is... Um, if someone that were to build something like that... Sorry? If they, someone was to build a system, right? Yeah. But they didn't have the dish at the moment, but they could build that. Yes. They could see the noise figure by going between the yeah, small sky yeah, and ground. Yeah. What sort of fi figure would you... Okay, think? well, just, just, with this, just with this on its own... Um, just with this hooked up to a, uh, a receiver, just cold sky pointing at the ground or operating that, you'll see pretty much about 6 dB. Yeah. In fact, there have been EME contacts made with a humongous station on the other end, just with this, no dish. Um, in fact, there's been contact made with the guy tracking the moon, one guy holding it. <laughs> oh, yeah. A bit of QSB. But, um, <laughs> so that's sort of showing off a bit. But, uh, uh, certainly, you know, not that. So. Well, listen to me, it took, it took a lot for me to get my head around the fact that you got more power out of a a dummy load than you did at pointing an antenna at the sky. That just didn't seem to make any sense to me. But it's purely a function of temperature, isn't it? Yes. It's, yeah. it's the fact that the ground is hot and therefore there's on the Kelvin. molecular movement going on on the Kelvin scale. And presumably your dummy load is more or less the same temperature it's as the, the ground. It's so the same you're actually looking at the same thing. Mm. So that really? gives people an idea with their terrestrial systems too, mm. how good they are. You know, ground to sky. Yeah. Um, yeah. In comparison with uh, something. Like yeah. That. Yeah. You can just, you just that's right. Just do it with, just do it with that. I mean, the, uh, I would sort of do tests before I even put this on a dish to make sure that it was half by working, mm. or well, not half by working. You know, pretty well fully, fully working. Yeah. Um, it's got to be, it's got to be treated as a fairly meticulous exercise if you want more than one or two contacts with 30 foot dishes and a thousand watts uh, sort, sort of thing because it is it is the epitome of weak signal work is what it amounts to but fortunately there are no other factors to consider other than path loss that's all you have to worry about well that's quite a worry in itself i know but but nevertheless there's nothing else you have to worry about May I make a comment, if I could? Go ahead, John. Yeah, no, I was just trying to back you up with your two-meter uh, contact, and I was sit when I was at Wakeley, which is around about eight to ten years ago, I had a contact with a really big station over in Italy. Now, I really can't... It was an I number, and I said, if I said he was Frank, I may be totally wrong, but I had a system of uh, two... two uh, 12 element beams pointing directly at the moon. Uh, I was using a logger, an EME logger, I can't remember what it was, but he was there to talk to. And uh, he produced a signal out of, I think, now I'm going to say around 8 to 10 similar arrays of antennas on one great big thing. He's actually got it on his website, but I can't remember his call sign. Uh, I heard him distinctly. He never heard me, uh, but like you were talking about, powerful station, etc. But it was uh, really early in uh, in my life with two meters, etc. And I, I gave it away, but I'll, I'll, I've since um, will take it on in, in the future, in the next year. 
but uh, it was just phenomenal what he what he achieved for me was what you can actually do if you've got some sort of gear and 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 um, uh, now I've got he didn't hear me I heard him that's correct and his signal was just like uh, uh, talking on two meters across Brisbane. So I'm only making a comment to follow you up is what you said whatever equipment you've got you can give it a go but it also needs an, uh, that EME to logger that I can't remember what it's too long ago what it was but uh, that, that was of great assistance as well no, that's interesting John <clears throat> any more questions from any of the guys uh, checked in remotely now, what about from the room? Any more questions or comments? Peter? I'm trying to get him for 10 minutes. Sorry, Peter. Um, when you're doing your cold sky measurements. Sorry? When you're doing your cold sky measurements. Yes. Does it make a difference if it's during the night or during the day at all? So I make a difference. When it's daytime? Make a difference, sorry, the angle that you're pointing at. No, the time of the day, whether the sun's up or the sun's down. No, so long as the sun is not in the proximity. Yeah. Yeah, the sun's pretty... Pretty, pretty powerful. Um, no, so long as you're, it depends, of course, on the half power beam width, of basically, of, of your system, determines how close you can get to the sun. But no, as, so long as you, so long as the sun is, signal of the sun is not getting to this, um, or not getting to the reflector. No, it doesn't. That it doesn't doesn't matter. Um, Trevor, on the, the circular polarisation, has the EME community settled on left hand or right hand, or is it just 50-50? Sorry, is EME... Uh, the, the community that's used this, um, playing around with... The same it. standard. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all space communication seems to be left hand circular left for hand. reception, okay. and right hand circular going up. But don't forget, when you aim it into your dish, it reverses. Yeah. You don't want to be on the yeah. wrong polarity, you'll get nothing. Mm. I can guarantee. So <laughs> as soon as you, you generate it as a right-hand wave going into the dish, and it becomes a left-hand because of reflection, then everybody uses the yeah. same. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. It does, it does change. Like, <clears throat> looking at you, Andre, I'm, I'm myself describing a clockwise signal. What are you seeing it as? Yeah, yeah, it's the opposite. The, the opposite, yeah. yeah. Right, well, that's the same as on the moon. Or this, of course, looking into a reflector. And it gets reversed at the moon as well. Yeah. And reversed again going into the dish at yeah. the receiving end. But everybody's doing the same. So yeah. if, you, if you get it wrong, you get absolutely nothing. So we're looking, I mean, I'm looking at a clockwise here. But going here, I'm now looking at anti-clockwise. So that's, in other words, wherever it's reflecting from. So in terms of our new circular, that's just too hard to make the The other way of getting around this polarity mismatch is, of course, one way of getting around it is brute force with a couple of kilowatts and 64 yagis. <laughs> uh, that that sort of gets around that problem to, to, to some to some extent. Um, you know, it could be called brute force and ignorance. But however, any system that works has nothing to do with ignorance, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, the biggest station there's a two meter station. Some of you have worked on. I think he's he has 128 yagis on 432. You know yeah. him, uh, Cole. Yeah. Kevin's working yeah. also, Scott yeah. oh, right. I, I have never, I've had maybe 20 EME contacts ever, and I've never heard my own echoes. I don't have a system that's big enough or powerful enough or sensitive enough to hear my own echoes. That doesn't mean other people with all the, the mm -hmm. manpower mm -hmm. and the big antennas can't. So the fact that you don't hear your own doesn't matter. The big boys will hear you. Well, that guy, that guy with all those yagis yeah. working guy with the dipole on yeah. 432. Yeah. yeah, right. Is it DL7Y? No, I've just forgotten. DL7. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's got a terminal illness. Uh, in fact, I think he, in fact, I do know that all of his uh, equipment was for sale. Well, there's another big 
70 centimetre station in North America, that's Steve, K5, DOG. Yep. Yeah, yeah I've okay. worked him on 70 yeah. mil, so it's a single 21 element yard mm -hmm. and 70 watt. Does that Russian station, RW1, something rather, uh, still operate on two metres with about 120 feet? No, I've never seen it. Okay. No. Yeah, one John was talking about Franco IK2 FAK. So I worked him, I've got the card, and I worked him on two nine elements with no elevation and 150 watts on two. Yeah. So it can be done, it's just going to be in the wrong place. Well, one other little aspect that we haven't touched on because I mean it's such a broad subject is that Three, six, on two metres and 70 centimetres, there's ground gain. Mm. I, none of my antennas mm. have elevation capability, mm. so I can only look at the moon reflections when it's coming up or going down, because uh, I've got horizontal yardies. But when the sun, so when the moon is just coming up or setting, just for a short period of time, because of reflections off the ground, you get an apparent 6 dB advantage that you didn't have. So that's like going from one yagi to four, or going mm. from 60 watts to 290. So you're for that short period as the moon comes through the aperture of your beam, you've suddenly got a much more powerful station and that's when I loads on your beam. That, that's when I loads. actually get the chance to work people. Yeah. And it's so brief. It, yeah. But it can be done up. Um, Chris Skier, the who was a very early EME guy that I knew down in South Australia in VK five. He did it on two meters with all valve gear and rhombic antennas. So he had a pair of wires that were about 5k long across his farm, and he waited for the moon to come through the the beam. And at those days, you couldn't work out what time the moon was coming out. He used to get copies of the uh, North American Marine Almanacs so he could work out where the moon rise was actually. In. And the, the moon would just come through for a very short period through the window of, or the aperture of his beverage aerial, basically, and uh, had contacts to North America from here at the time when it must have just not been long after those very first contacts that uh, right. Trevor described. If, or, if you look at the, if you look at HB nine Q that you were talking about, he actually has a, a big logger there that goes from 6 metres through to uh, 76 gig and uh, they're all on it. Yeah. yeah. So whoever's working um, EME, they're all on, on all the frequencies, even the ones we don't have. Uh, he just has them on there. So that's that's a logger for EME, right? Yeah, that's right. And Trevor? I, nobody mentioned it, but it's just that I thought I'd just have a look because that wasn't the fellow that the logger I used. It was a different one, but anyway, that's a more comprehensive thing. It's really nice. It's worthwhile having a bow peep at. Gary, what frequency are you using on 23 centimeters? What? On what? Tw is, tw is it 1296.1 or? Um... Uh, yeah, actually, I could have covered that. Um, uh... 1296 decimal one, say 1296 up to about 08 is, sorry, up to about 05 is for analog, yeah. uh, un unofficially, uh, an unofficial agreement, and digital work is up near 1296.1. Well, yeah. Or just, well, just below it, is it? Yeah. yeah. One philosophy that you can go by and... Um, it's not a bad idea. It's an American philosophy that if at first you don't succeed, make something bigger. <laughs> and, and that works, of course. If you keep making it bigger, well, you'll eventually do what you set out to do. Well, all right. Well, on behalf of everybody here in, in the library... Kevin. 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 Sorry? Wayne has some... I'm sorry, Wayne. To, to answer Doug's question before, he was talking about the Russian with all the... No, not you, not you, Trevor. Oh, sorry. Doug. 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 Yeah. It's RN6BN was the guy that you're thinking of. I'm oh, saying right. Yes. Yeah. He had, I think, um, 64 or 128 15 element Yagis, crossed Yagis, and ran two kilowatts on two meters. I've heard him, I worked him EME on numerous occasions. I also heard his signal direct when I was beaming at the moon and beaming at him. So that gives you an idea how good his signal was. Mm. Mm. Well, on behalf of us all, I'd, I'd like to thank Trevor for a, an exceptionally stimulating um, 
presentation today. Um, thank you for preparing that. And uh, I think we should all thank Trevor in the traditional way. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, my wife, uh, Kathy, hi, Kathy, um, is responsible for uh, producing the uh, PowerPoint uh, slides that you've uh, seen tonight. Thank you.